Thank you, worship team, for leading us uh, in worship this evening. I'm very excited about this weekend, and I hope you are also. We have got one year of planning and preparing for this weekend. We're extremely excited to see all three congregations together this evening. And we also welcome all visitors from Sacramento and other areas as well. This is a blessed time as we expect the Lord to move mightily in our hearts this weekend. Thanks, Philip. Hopefully everybody has read Dr. Carson's bio. We've had a post at the church for quite a while now. We don't want to spend a lot of time going uh, over that. What did impress me as I searched his name on the web earlier this week? And on the site that I looked at, I noticed that he had spoke all around the world. Many messages out of different books of the Bible. I think just from reading a little bit about him, what touches me the most is his desire to share the Word of God with brothers and sisters. To study it diligently and know more about the God who created all things. So without further ado, let's uh, give Dr. Carson a warm welcome and Brother, Brother Winston will be interpreting for us. It is essentially a contrast between the just and the unjust. Between the righteous person and the unrighteous person. If you look closely at the Bibles in front of you, you will see that in the first three verses, the focus is on the righteous. Then in verses 4 and 5 on the unrighteous. And then, and then in chapter 6, there is a final summarizing contrast. Now let's take it step by step. The first three verses, focusing on the righteous, 
They begin with a description, first of all, that is negative, what the righteous are not like. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Then in verse 2, we have a positive description, what they are like. And in verse 3, a metaphorical description of what they are like. Now come back to verse 1. There are three steps in the verse. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. This is meant to conjure up the picture of someone who walks along side by side with someone who is essentially rebellious against God. Picking up bad advice. Adopting a worldview that is essentially against God. And if you do that long enough, you reach the second line. Such a man then stands in the way that sinners take. That is, it is now as if they are walking in their moccasins, walking in their shoes. It is no longer simply a matter of picking up advice that is a bit questionable. It is now adopting the lifestyle of those who are anti-God. And if you follow that path long enough, you come to the third line. He sits in the seat of mockers. Now he has to sit in his lazy chair and look down his long, self-righteous nose at all those stupid, ignorant, right-wing, bigoted Christians. It is not enough simply to adopt a style of life that is in defiance of God. Now there is sneering condescension. Then in verse 2, we find the same person described positively. Now, this was originally written in Hebrew poetry. There are different kinds of poetry, of course, in almost any language. Some forms of poetry depend on rhythm. Some forms of poetry depend on rhyme. Some forms of poetry depend on very colorful metaphors. But Hebrew poetry depends on parallelism. So that you can say something in one line and then say it a slightly different way in another line. And we call that synonymous parallelism. Or alternatively, you can say something in one line and put the opposite of it in another line. So what you would expect in verse 2 is something like this. Remember verse 1. Three points. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. 
He does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of mockers. So you would expect in verse 2, blessed rather is the man that walks in the counsel of the righteous. Who stands in the way of the godly? Who sits in the seat of the praising? In other words, that is what you would expect from Hebrew poetry. So why hasn't the author given it to us? The reason that he breaks structure is because he wants us to see that one sole criterion is enough. The righteous person is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. And when you stop to think about it, you, you realize that this really is the antithesis to verse 1. Instead of picking up the advice of ungodly people, this person is now picking up the advice of the Word of God. And that, in turn, will lead to a different kind of behavior. Which then likewise leads to a life of praise instead of a life of sneering condescension. When I was a young man, there was a teacher of preaching in the seminary where I now teach. He was a master of one-liners. He liked to say to us, you are not what you think you are. But what you think, what you think you are. So it is here. Uh, it, if the word of God fills out your whole mind, that shapes who you are. You recall what God said to Joshua when Joshua was taking over the leadership from Moses. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. Then you shall make your way successful. Or you recall what Paul says when he writes to the Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, you're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. That means that regardless of our walk of life, whether we teach or study in the university, or fix car in a garage, whether we sweep the streets or bring up children, if we are Christians, all of us need to have as a priority the constant absorption of the Word of God. Moreover, it is not just a question of doing it the way you clean your teeth in the morning. Nobody takes a toothbrush and says, Oh, I can hardly wait. This will be so much fun. 
你刷牙的时候不是觉得很好玩？ You you clean your teeth because it's good for you. So there are some people who read their Bibles just because it's good for them. And of course it is. It's better to read it for that reason than not to read it. And, and yet what is depicted here is something more than that. That's a 这这些话语教导你的是不不同的话。Look at what the text says. 那这里是讲什么呢 ？His delight is in the law of the Lord. 他的他的他是在那里喜，他是喜爱耶和华的律法。And on his law he meditates day and night. 在那里昼夜思想。In other words, we ought to be doing whatever we can to develop. Joy in reading the Bible. So, when we are in the Bible, we need to have a joy in reading the Bible. Delight in thinking it through. 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 It takes meditation. We are sitting there. We need to think. Thinking about it. We need to sit there and meditate. Systematic reading of the whole of God's most holy word. Here, there is a procedure, a system to read. So, in verse one, the righteous person is described negatively. So, in the first verse, here, the righteous person is described negatively. In verse two, he is described positively. The second verse, he is described negatively. Now in verse three, he's described metaphorically. Be, then the third verse is just using a metaphor. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now Israel, of course, like much of California, is a semi-arid land. 啊，以色列就好像我们，呃，加州的一样，在那里很干旱。So when there are no rains, much of the country looks dead and bleak and brown. 所以我们夏天不下雨的时候，我们看看都是黄色的。Then the first rains come, and later in the summer, the second rains come. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, they call it that. <laughs> 我我然后呢，我们就预期来了，我们就预期来了。And and、um, everything begins to turn green. 我们就看到那里预期来了。That's the picture of Christians here, of believers here. 所以我们这里看到信徒是这样的一个。Except except that this tree has been carefully planted by streams, plural, of water. 所以这里这棵树啊，是栽在溪水旁。用英文的话，还是讲到有好几条溪水的旁边。So instead of being dependent upon seasonal irrigation， 所以这不只是有季节在那里可以有水。Which means that you sometimes look alive and sometimes look dead。有的时候有水，就好像很活；有有,有没有水的时候，就很枯干。You have been actually intentionally planted by a confluence of streams that guarantees you always look alive. But the tree is planted by a confluence of streams that guarantees you always look alive. But the tree is planted by a confluence of streams that guarantees you always look alive. In other words, you are an evergreen. So you are a evergreen. And at the appropriate season, you bear fruit. So you are a evergreen. When we are told whatever they do prospers in the last line, ah, then say, 凡他所做的尽都顺利 The psalmist is not succumbing to prosperity gospel. Ah, 这这里不是那个呃顺利顺利福音的这这派人讲的话 Rather, this is part of the metaphorical world. 这里是有比喻 That is, even in years of drought, even in years of dryness, this plant is always alive. It always prospers precisely because it is planted by a confluence of streams. 
，所以说，就算在寒季，因为它是在好几条溪水的那里，它也是叶子也不枯干。This metaphor often shows up in the prophets. 所以在呃，我们的先知书里边也常常是提到这样的一个比喻。Consider the contrast in Jeremiah chapter 17. 就好像呃耶利米书十七章这样讲。First of all, verses five and six. 在第五节、第六节这样讲。Do you have the text? Yeah, five and six. Just five and six first. 第五节。Okay, I read. 耶和华如此说。依靠人血肉的宝贝，心里离弃耶和华的，那人是有祸了。因他不像沙漠的途中，不见福乐来到，却要住在旷野干旱之地，无人居住的田地。Did you notice the first two lines of verse s That person will be like a bush in the wastelands; they will not see prosperity when it comes. 这里讲到这个人啊，你看第六节这里说，他像沙漠里面的途中。By contrast, the righteous person is described in verses seven and eight. 然后他讲到这一人是在第七、第八两节讲讲到。Go ahead and read those. 耶和华依靠耶和华，以耶和华为可靠的，大人有福了。他不他必像树栽在水旁，在河边扎根，炎热来到并不惧怕，叶子也仍青翠，在干旱之年毫无挂虑。In other words, all of us will sooner or later face some kind of dry year, some kind of sparseness. So, so we in life, often, times, is winter comes. If you live long enough, you will suffer. Because, because if you live long enough, you will suffer. You will either be bereaved or you'll bereave somebody else. If you live long enough, you will suffer cancer. Or Alzheimer's. Or both. <laughs> All you have to do is live long enough. And many of us along the line suffer heartache, illness, loneliness, disappointment at work, disappointment in our family. Christians are not exempt from those things. But what sustains them in these barren, dry years? Well, it still remains the Word of God, which nurtures them, teaches them how to think, gives them joy even in sorrow. That's why when Christians face death, as the Apostle Paul says, we sorrow, but notice those who have no hope. And all of this stability comes from the Word of God. Verse 2. Which serves then as life-giving water for us. Verse three. The second verse is giving us the water. These springs are able to nourish us. Come, come, and the third verse. So here is a portrait of a righteous person. Then here, the third verse is talking about describing how they are. Described. Negatively in verse one, positively in verse two, metaphorically in verse three. Uh, 反面，从第一节是反面，第二节是用正面来描写，第三节用比喻来描写。Now we come to verses four and five. 然后我们来看第四、第五两节。In the Hebrew, this begins with a very, very strong negation. 
在希伯来文开始就有一个很反面的这样讲法 ，Not so the wicked, not so。他说恶人并不是这样，并不是这样。It is as if everything of significance that you want to say about the righteous person, you must now deny to the unrighteous person。因为他前面讲的三节所有讲是一人的，这里恶人并不这样。Are the righteous those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked? This one is not Well, not so the wicked. Not so. That's what they do. Are the righteous those who do not walk in the ways of the ungodly? Or sit in the seat of mockers. Not so the wicked. Not so. Are the righteous those who meditate on the word of God day and night and delight in it? Not so the wicked, not so. Are the righteous those who are like a tree planted by streams of water that brings forth its fruit in its season and whose leaf never withers? Not so the wicked, not so. So then, what are they like? That's what they're not like. What are they like? The psalmist says they're like chaff that the wind drives away. In the ancient world, you took the heads of grain and you you beat the heads with a little shovel. 就好像刚才我们打麦打麦的时候 ，it forced the external chaff off the seed. The seed would fall to the ground. 这这这，康蒂把它打下来，然后这个种子就掉到地上，但是呢，康蒂就出来了。That seed would be dried and eventually crushed to make flour for bread. 呃，这个。种子里边掉在地上，我们把它拿起来，可以来做面粉，可以来做面包。But the external chaff just blew away. 但是那些糠粒就却被风吹散。Unlike the tree, 不像这树 ，the chaff was rootless. 因为这些糠粒它是不像的树，是没有根的。Lifeless, 是没有生命的。Fruitless, 是没有果子的。Worthless. Unable to absorb the water, it's a massive contrast. So that in the view of a temporal world, the chaff sometimes looks very attractive. But when you measure things over the next fifty billion years or so, this is an obvious sort of assessment. 就好像是你在刚刚开始的时候，你就觉得有的时候空气还蛮漂亮的。但是在亿万年里边，在滚石里边，那是没有价值的。And in case we haven't got the picture firmly in our head, it's spelled out for us in verse five. 但是然后呢，我们从第五节更明白能够来看。Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. 所以他他说到审判的时候，恶人被站立不住，罪人在义人中的会。And then. Verse six gives a final summarizing contrast. 第六节就给了整个整个总结 Now note carefully what the text says. 我们注意要注意真正是怎么写 It is not a contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. 这呢并不是说义人跟恶人有什么不一样 But between the way of the righteous and the way of the unrighteous. 这个不一样是义人的道路和恶人的道路 The way of the unrighteous, we're told, will be wiped out. Like a trail by the seashore when the tide is out. Like a trail by the seashore when the tide is out. 
Then the tide rolls in, and the tide rolls out, and there's no more trains in the trail. Long lai la, long chu la. How come to be able? Fifty billion years from now, nobody is going to write historical dissertations on the significance of Adolf Hitler. 在亿万年以后，没有人还会想到希特勒做些什么。But every glass of cold water given in the name of the Lord Jesus will still be celebrated. In other words, it's, it's not just that the wicked perish, but that their way perishes. It leads to destruction, and it itself is destroyed. By contrast, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. That is, He acknowledges it as His. So this is what Psalm 1 says. There are two ways to live, and there is no third. Does this psalm trouble you a bit? It ought to. It's painted in very black and white colors. Which of these two categories do you belong to? And I suspect most of us would say, well, sometimes the first, but pretty often the second. <laughs> there are some self-righteous people who say, oh, I do all that, I'm definitely with the righteous crowd. <laughs> In which case, they're probably blind to their own faults. And they have become very self-righteous, condescending people. But if you belong to the second side, where is the hope in Psalm 1? Does the Bible give us mere moralisms? Moreover, when you read through the narratives of human beings in the Bible, you discover again and again that that even the great heroes of the faith are often massively inconsistent. There is Noah, a great preacher of righteousness. Believing God's commands, it seems so foolish to the world. And after the flood, the first thing he does is get drunk. There's Abraham, the father of the faithful. Willing to obey God. Even in the matter of the sacrifice of Isaac. He was also a liar. More than once. Risking his wife. So there were times when he could be a pretty lousy husband too. And then there's Moses. The humblest man who ever lived, except Jesus. God's own agent in giving the law. 
接着他把律法带出来 ，and then rescuing his people from the land of slavery， 然后把他的呃子民从呃奴仆捆绑中间释放出来。But even this great man of God can lose his temper， 然后但是这个人呢，有的时候就却在那发脾气。And jeopardize his own future in the promised land. And just because he's in a fight, he's just going to let his own future be ruined. And then there's David. Then there's David, excellent administrator. David is such a great general, courageous man of war, is is very strong man. The sweet poet of Israel. He is also in there. He wrote so many songs. Also an adulterer and a murderer. But he is also in there. He is in there. This is the man whom the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. One wonders how far he would have gone if he hadn't been a man after God's own heart. And it's not just the Old Testament. There's Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Yet it's only minutes later that Jesus has to round on him and say, "Get behind me, Satan! You don't understand the things of God." But the next line, this Jesus says. There is Peter preaching a spectacular sermon with wonderful unction on the day of Pentecost. Then this Peter, he in the Pentecost sermon, he preached a wonderful sermon. And there he is in Antioch getting rebuked by Paul because the poor fellow has God's theology very well sorted out. But then he in Antioch he gave Paul a reproof because he didn't get his theology sorted out. There. Is a handful of people in the Bible of whom nothing negative is said. So, there are how many people in the Bible who have nothing negative to say? Daniel, perhaps. Daniel said something. Ruth, uh, uh, Ruth said something. But I guarantee that if the Bible had said a bit more, it would have found something bad about them too. That's true. But the section in which they have the stories said the short and the long, maybe it has something to say. So the question becomes, how do you link all of these narratives about people who are so inconsistent with passages like Psalm one, where everything is so black and white? That's so you need. 在那里讲，我们来看圣经，好像诗篇第一篇这样讲的这么黑白的时候，你应该怎么看 ？And how does this finally relate to the whole Bible message that brings you to Jesus anyway? 你这个整篇来看。So let me use the rest of my time this evening to give you some biblical and theological reflections on how you put these things together and what they mean in our lives. So, I, 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 The first thing we must do is recognize how we ourselves can be influenced by our own culture. Especially in the Caucasian Western world, not as far as I can see quite so much in the Chinese Western world, but certainly in the Caucasian Western world, and it's coming to you too. <laughs> 首先，他说在这个白人的西方世界里边 ，OK， 是这样。We like to have moral、uh, equivalence. We like to have moral flexibility. 我们在那里就觉得我们的呃，我们的呃呃呃，我们应该有有呃 ，flexible， 呃，有有有有有上下。我们的这个呃，我我我们的道道德应该有有有改变，有有有弹性，我们的弹性。I agree. <laughs> so there are of course some films where there are just good guys and bad guys. 所以呢，我们有的时候我们看电影
的时候，我们就看到里面有好人有坏人。But those films don't get the Academy Awards. 但是这种这种电影呢，好像不会得金像奖吧 ？The films that get the Academy Awards are always the ones with a great deal of moral ambivalence in them. 那这个里面呃，常常得金像奖的里面，他的道德是呃有含糊的。A few years ago, there was a, a film called Crash. Did some of you see it? Well, maybe most of you don't go to film, but I'll tell you. <laughs> In Crash, there are four pairs of people. And at the beginning of the film, as the story unwinds, one of each of the pairs seems to be good, and the other seems to be bad. So in the beginning of the film, there are some small stories. One is completely seen. Some are good, and two are bad. Then by the end of the film, in each of the pairs, the one who was bad now appears to be good, and the one who was good now appears to be bad. Now that's why the film is called Crash. So in this film, the film is called Crash. There was a car crash. But there's a crash of moral claims too. 就是说道德的唱车。That year, that film won the best film award. And, and so there is a constant pressure in our culture to like moral ambiguity and to be a little suspicious of straight lines and absolutes. I still do a fair number of university missions. A few weeks ago, I was on the Berkeley campus. Do you know what I discover speaking to university students who are biblically illiterate? Because there are many university students who don't know the Bible has two testaments. They've never heard of Abraham. They don't know much about Jesus. And if I start expounding to them, let's say, the deity of Christ, or if I start explaining to them something difficult like the doctrine of the Trinity, or substitutionary atonement, they don't take offense. They look at me and they say, in effect, very interesting. Is that what Christians think? It's a bit strange, but it's interesting. But if I get anywhere near the topic of sin, they are instantly very upset. Who are you to say to me what's right or wrong? That's because our culture in the Western world has become very suspicious of moral absolutes. So suspicious that if anybody does hold to moral absolutes, they are judged to be intolerant. In fact, tolerance has become the primary moral absolute. So, in that, we how to come to this society is to say you can receive others. This is a very good thing. So, a number of years ago, I was writing something on the Book of Job. 
。呃，几年前我在那里写关于约伯记的事。You remember how Job is put together？ 呃，我不晓得这个约伯记里面怎么写。Job does not know that God in the background has a bet with the devil himself。不晓得。这个约伯记头上是告诉我们说，因为神跟这个摩西在那里打赌。God says, Have you considered my servant Job? How how he is faithful and righteous and a, a, a just man. 啊，神说，这个约伯这个人，他是一个义人。And the devil says, Take away his money, take away his wealth, and then eventually take away his health, and he'll curse you to your face. 所以这这这个魔鬼就说，当你把你的他的钱，把他的健康都拿走的话，他一定会做。So the test begins. 所以这个在那里就有这样一个试验。Job loses his wealth. 约伯他把他的财产都没有。His vast herds are all taken by raiders. 他的牛羊都拿走了。He loses his family in a terrible storm. All ten children die. 在一个在一个呃风暴里面，他十个小孩都去世了。Then he loses his health， 然后他的健康也不好了。And he sits on an ash pit and uses a piece of broken pottery to pick at his scabs。所以他说，当你坐在灰里面用瓦来刮自身体。And yet he still prays, naked I came into the world and naked I shall leave it. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 然后他还是这样说：“我是侧身而来，我侧身而去，我要一切要葬在这。” And then his three miserable friends arrive. 他们还有所谓三个朋友来了。They do only one wise thing. 他们只做了一件智慧的事情。They arrive and then they shut up for the first week. 他们走。一上来一个星期嘛，没有讲话。And then they are going to teach Job some theology. 然后呢，他们就在那教训约伯。At Job, um, do you believe that God is just? 你你相不相信神是公义的 ？Yes. 是是。So because God is just, He punishes the ungodly. 他是公义的，所以他是要在那里。Well, yes. That's it. So, what are you learning from the punishment that you're suffering from? So, you get the punishment. You think you're going to be a better man? And Job says, "Well, I believe that God is just, but I have to say that I don't deserve this." Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I say I believe God is just, but I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. Job, do you hear what you're saying? Are you questioning the justice of God? Job says, "Listen, I'm not questioning the justice of God. All I'm saying is, uh, I, I, I don't think that what's happening to me is fair." I've always been generous with the poor. I've always prayed for my own children. I, I made a covenant with my eyes so that I would not lust after young women. And, 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 and what I'm suffering now is just not just. But Job, Job, don't you know that God knows everything? And so he makes no mistakes. If he doesn't make any mistakes in your suffering, don't you have to recognize that you must have had secret sins in your life somewhere? So he doesn't make any mistakes in your suffering, don't you have to recognize that you must have had secret sins in your life somewhere? So he doesn't make any mistakes in your suffering. What you should do, Job, is repent of the sins that you don't know that you've committed. So you need to go there and repent, repent of the sins you don't know that you've committed. Okay. You've undoubtedly committed far more than you will ever remember. You, you, the sins you don't even remember. But if you repent of those sins that you don't remember, God will restore all the blessings on your life. But if you repent of those sins that you don't remember, God will restore all the blessings on your life. 
，唯一讲这些，你自己都不晓得对，那么神，嗯、你可可以来呃保守你了。And Job says, how can I possibly do that? That would be a lie. <laughs> If I did repent of something that I don't think I need to repent of, I'm committing a new sin by lying about repentance. Do you know what I really need? I need a lawyer. <laughs> That's what he says. And the, the drama builds up and builds up and builds up. And finally, God himself answers. What does God say? Job? Have you ever designed a snowflake? Hmm? Have you ever uh, cast a constellation like Orion into the heavens? Were you around when I designed the hippopotamus, Job? <laughs> Two or three chapters of these rhetorical questions. Until Job finally says, uh, I'm sorry, I, I repent. I, I get the point. I don't understand very much. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> And God says, stand up on your feet. I've got two more chapters of rhetorical questions to ask you. <laughs> Now let me tell you, today's contemporary literary critics love this. They don't like Psalm 1 very much. It's too black and white. But Job is wonderful, it's so confused. <laughs> it's, so, it's so morally ambiguous. God really doesn't even answer Job's questions. He just keeps telling Job an effect you're not big enough to understand. Deep, deep. <laughs> And then you get to Job 42. And the literary critics have a heart attack. <laughs> Because the book has a happy ending. <laughs> It's not morally ambiguous after all. The Lord blesses Job. He gets twice as many sheep. Twice as many cattle. Twice as many donkeys. And the same number of children. I mean, twice as many children would have been a bit harder as well. <laughs> And the book has a happy ending. And the critics say, this is stupid. <laughs> this couldn't have been written by the same author that wrote the rest of it. This must have been written by some third-rate hack, an editor, that comes along and doesn't know what he's doing, just slops in a happy ending. But you know, it's not a mistake. Because despite all the ambiguities of life, in the end, God wins. Job 
Job 42 is to the book of Job what the book of Revelation is to the whole Bible. In the end, God wins. And God's absolutes will prevail. So if there are times when we have to walk without understanding by faith now, we still have faith in the God who will bring things out at the end. Now the reason I have taken you through this exercise in Job is simply to remind you that our culture loves moral ambiguity. And that makes us less sympathetic to a passage like Psalm 1, which is so absolute. Now, there's a second thing that I need to bring up. The Bible is made up of different literary genres. In the Bible, you find chronologies, histories, parables, you find letters, apocalyptic revelation, narratives, Beatitudes, uh, and all of these different forms of literature have their own way of making their appeal. Psalm 1 is often called a wisdom song. Because in a great deal of wisdom literature, there is a kind of sharp absolute divide. In the book of Proverbs, for example, which is wisdom literature, you're either following lady wisdom or you're following dame folly. And you know who in the New Testament often preaches in wisdom categories? The Lord Jesus. Do you remember how he ends the Sermon on the Mount? He ends the Sermon on the Mount with four absolute intimacies. Do you build your house on the rock or do you build your house on sand? If you build it on a rock, it'll withstand storms and winds and waves. If you build it on sand, the first storm that comes along, it'll all get washed away. There are just two foundations. Rock and sand. There's no point in someone coming along and saying, you yeah, know, well, I don't like either of them. I like over hard man play. <laughs> in other words, Jesus sometimes offers just two absolutes. So, likewise, he says, there is a narrow gate and a straightened way that leads to eternal life. And there's a wide gate and a broad way that leads to destruction. So, 
So which way are you going? And there's no point saying, oh, I'd like an in-between way. Not too good, not too bad, not too broad, not too small. But one of the wonderful things about the Lord Jesus is that he not only preaches in wisdom literature, but he also has many different styles of preaching. So he can be absolute like these passages. But then you find him with the woman at the well in John 4, and remember that he is so gentle and probing and careful to the same Jesus who preaches in absolutes weeps over the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks with you and God? In other words, Jesus himself demonstrates not only the absolutes of wisdom literature, but also the gentleness and the compassion and the flexibility of a good pastor. So now let me come to the point. Supposing the Bible had only narratives in which there were heroes who were flawed. Supposing it had no passages like Psalm 1, but lots of stories about men like David. What would you and I conclude? Wouldn't we start saying, well, if even David can keep his trousers up, I mean, who am I? <laughs> By itself, in other words, the morally ambiguous stories might actually, if they were left all alone, serve to justify our own moral failings. But supposing, by contrast, the Bible gave us only absolutes like Psalm 1. And no accounts of a failure like David or Abraham. How would we respond then? We would either become self-righteous hypocrites or we would be driven to absolute despair. In other words, we need both the absolutes and the account of the inconsistencies. We need the accounts of the absolute so that we can see what God's standards are. But all of those stories of inconsistencies and ambiguities and failures drive us to make us recognize that at the end of the day we cannot save ourselves. Psalm 1 is not given to tell us how to be saved. 
十天第一天，不是说我们就要教我们怎么样能够得救。Someone will tell us what saved people will increasingly be like. 然后他是告诉我们，要我们能够给得救、拯救之后应该是怎么样。It anticipates the perfection that will take place on the last day in the consummation. 他是说我们在那个到末日的那日。But in the context of the whole canon, it is not saying just just do verses one, two, and three, and you'll be saved on the last day. So it's not saying, it's not saying, oh, you read the verses, it's saying you have to do the first verse, the second verse, the third verse, the fourth verse, the fifth verse, the sixth verse, the seventh verse, the eighth verse, the ninth verse, the tenth verse, the eleventh verse, the twelfth verse, the thirteenth verse, the fourteenth verse, the fifteenth verse, the sixteenth verse, the seventeenth verse, the eighteenth verse, the nineteenth verse, the twentieth verse, the twenty first verse. We need the accounts of of David and Peter and all the rest to remind us that even God's most noble followers are sinners yet and need grace. We are to depend on David, to depend on Abraham. These people. 虽然他们是在神面前是一个伟人，但是呢，他们还是会跌倒。And thus the Bible as a whole drives us again and again and again, finally closer to Jesus and His cross. 所以，圣经能够渐渐的、渐渐的就把我们带到耶稣十字架的光照里面。Apart from the grace that Grants us forgiveness. We have no hope. Apart from the fact that Jesus bore our sins in His own body on the tree, we stand guilty before God. But once that gospel is promulgated, once that gospel is seen for what it is, then it is important for Christians to understand that that gospel powerfully transforms us to increasing holiness. 但是我们做基督徒的，我们看到这样的福音的时候，就来应该看这些福音，就带我们能够更成圣。It's not that reading the Bible saves you. But it's almost impossible to believe that you really are saved if you don't love to read the Bible. It's not as if avoiding the counsel of the wicked saves you. But if the grace of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has saved you, surely you're not going to want to spend a whole lot of time following the advice of the ungodly. 但是，如果你相信耶稣基督给你这个恩典，来拯救你的话，你就不会去从恶人的计谋。And that is the reason why the Bible can sometimes speak with the Astonishing absolutes that it does. So, in the Bible, sometimes, why in such times can be white black to put in our hands? Let me give you one more, and we're done. Then I'll give you the last one. This comes from First John chapter three. Then we'll see the second letter of John, the third chapter. First John, the third chapter. First John, the third chapter. First John, the third chapter. Now, especially verse nine. Now, now I wish I had time to explain the surrounding passages a little more. But just focus on verse nine for a moment. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. That's very strong language. This is a very strong language. Are you born of God? 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 Are you born of
But do you go on sinning? What do you do with this verse? When I was a boy in school, a long time ago, I was in grade 7. I had a teacher called Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper had been a soldier in the Canadian Army in World War II. And you could tell he wished he were still in the army. <laughs> he seemed to think that he was on a parade square and yelled at the kids giving orders. <laughs> he had a bad leg from the war. And if our class began to get a little rowdy, he might stand up behind his big, heavy oak desk. Lift the desk with his fingers on one edge, like this. Then slam it down on the ground. Which got attention. And then he would say, that's only one tenth of my strength. <laughs> Which is not the way you grab the attention of 12 and 13 year old boys. <laughs> but he had this military background and he thought in military terms. If there's one thing he hated, it was gum chewing. He loathed it with a passion. And if he caught you chewing gum, he would take the garbage can, hobble down to your desk, hold the garbage can under your nose. <laughs> And recite these lines. A gum chewing boy and a cud chewing cow. <laughs> Look so much alike, but different somehow. <laughs> what is the difference? Ah, I see it now. <laughs> Tis a thoughtful look in the face of the cow. <laughs> Spit! <laughs> now, let us think analytically about what Mr. Cooper was saying. <laughs> Mr. Cooper was saying, you cannot chew gum here. And it would have quite missed the point if a little boy, three rolls over, said, ontologically speaking, Mr. Cooper, you're mistaken. I'm doing it. <laughs> because when Mr. Cooper says you cannot chew gum here, he is not speaking of an ontological impossibility. He is speaking of a moral imperative. So I looked at all of the passages in the New Testament that use the verb cannot do something. And I found that between a quarter and a third of them are not speaking of ontological possibilities of talking about moral imperatives. Do you, do you see what this means? It means this is the church of the living God. You cannot sin here. If you're born of God, you cannot go on sinning. If you are born of God, you cannot go on sinning. 
And it misses the point to say, excuse me, Don, <laughs> you're mistaken, I'm doing it. <laughs> the point is, if you're a blood-bought child of God, you cannot go and say it's unthinkable. It's not impossible, it's just bizarre. This is the church of the living God. You, you will fight sin because you cannot sin here. This is the church. And yet the tragedy is we still sin. Which is why this book also has the verse in it at the end of chapter 1 and verse 2. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We need the absolutes to remind us what is not done here. We need the grace of the gospel to address us in our need because God help us until the consummation we sometimes do sin. And that is how you put your Bible together. Let me pray. Merciful God, there are undoubtedly some who have gathered here who really do think that they are acceptable before you because they try hard and are good. But in point of fact, there is none righteous, no, not one. A text like Psalm 1 drives again and again and again to despair, apart from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And undoubtedly there are others here who really do believe the gospel, but are using the gospel as a cloak for hidden sin. That's not right either. Help us to see with clarity of mind how absolute your standards of righteousness are and love them. Help us to see that out of the glories of being born again, sinning is not done here. And so enable us to fight with faith, humility, contrition, repentance, obedience, returning to the cross again and again, where alone we can find health and forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. 主啊我们今天以把你带的绝对的标准放在我们中间告诉我们这是永生神的教会我们在这里不能犯罪但是你更告诉我你自己在十字架上为我们带进了这个罪主啊我们能够来到你的面前来到你依靠你来做到圣经
thank you, Dr. Carson and uh, Brother Winston for interpreting. I feel like I've just been given a fresh, uh, nice, cool, refreshing glass of water in the desert. Well, what the guy you do not talk to John Dog, but I need to take a top one there, put all your big young feet on there. A lot to uh, digest this evening. Just a reminder that we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Please be diligent in coming at least a half hour early as you did this evening. You can see in the handout that tomorrow's title will be Escape from the Swamp. If you'd like to come and pray beforehand, you can come an hour early to room number three. All prayers are appreciated and welcome. Let's go ahead and, and close this evening. Spirit of the living God, we praise you and thank you for being here this evening with us. And Lord, we pray that we will not leave unchanged this evening. Lord, not only would you encourage and uplift us, but you would bring conviction to transform us. And Lord, we would desire to feed on your word. To meditate on it day and night. To know more about who you are. And desire to walk in the light of Jesus. That we may take root and bear fruit for your glory. Lord, I just pray that you would grant everybody safe travels this evening. Lord, I pray that you would give Dr. Carson a good night's sleep tonight. But Lord, you come up tomorrow with your spirit renewed and fresh within him. To once again to challenge your people. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.